So good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the university and to another in our distinguished lecture series. Bishop Tom Williams this evening will speak on the topic Christian faith in the city of Liverpool over 170, 175 years. Is it better together or getting worse? There's a sculpture on Hope Street from, who, from where we get our name, Liverpool Hope, the street that links both the cathedrals, which celebrates the contribution that Archbishop Derek Warlock and Bishop David Shepherd made to the city. Their friendship established a natural and secure foundation for the unity of Christian life and action. The sculptor, Stephen Broadbent, who did another piece for us, which hangs in the Gateway Building, very insightful, insightfully reproduced in bronze the list of newspaper headlines and captions that illustrate the ecumenical achievements of, of, of these two great churchmen. One of those headlines reproduced is a celebration of the coming together of the three colleges that today make up Liverpool Hope University. Liverpool, you may or may not know, is the only place in Europe that has brought together two Catholic and one Anglican college into a common foundation which forms the foundation of this university. This is a remarkable and distinctive achievement which frankly I don't think exists anywhere in the world, but it does exist here in our great city of Liverpool. This series of lectures celebrates the 175th year since the founding of our first college in 1844. In fact, our first two colleges, including the Notre Dame College in 1856, these two precede the first red brick universities in England by several decades. In fact, you've probably heard me repeat ad nauseam that in 1844, there were only six universities in England, and none of them admitted women, or Catholics, or Jews. That is the England in which our first college was established. So at the heart of these founding colleges was the will to include the socially disenfranchised, who formed, as you know, the largest part of the English population. That work of inclusion and empowerment through education is what we celebrate here this year as we celebrate our 175th anniversary. Now to our speaker. Thomas Williams, our speaker, was born in Sylvester Street in Liverpool, just off Scotland Road. His parents lived and worked in this city. Bishop Williams trained for the priesthood at Christleton Hall in Chester before he went on to the English College in Lisbon, Portugal, in 1966, where he studied philosophy. He completed his studies at St. Joseph's College of Holland, which was then the major seminary for the Archdiocese of Liverpool. Ordained first as deacon in 1971, within six months he was ordained to the priesthood by Archbishop George Andrew Beck on the 27th of May, 1972, in our cathedral in Liverpool. He has never left the city, which he knows so well and loves so deeply. He served in several parishes, including St. Francis of Assisi, Garston, Sacred Heart, Liverpool, Our Lady of Walsingham, Netherton, our Lady Immaculate, Liverpool, and then, of course, St. Anthony's, going back full circle to Scotland Road. On the 15th of April, 2003, Bishop Williams was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of Liverpool by Pope John Paul II. He received his Episcopal consecration from Archbishop Patrick Kelly with two bishops uh, as co-consecrators, Bishop Vincent Malone, and Bishop Augustine Harris. And of course, Bishop Maloney is with us and is a great friend and supporter of this university. 
As Auxiliary Bishop of Liverpool, he also serves as Chair of the Healthcare Reference Group of the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales. His abiding commitment to chaplaincy goes back to his days at Sacred Heart, where he served as chaplain to schools and to the Royal Liverpool Hospital. During his ministry, Bishop Williams has also been a member of the Archdiocese, the Archdiocese Finance Advisory Committee, uh, which he was appointed to in 1977. He's been the secretary and treasurer of the Fund for Retired and Sick Clergy, a member of the Liverpool City Ecumenical Team, a member of the Archdiocese and Building Projects Committee, and he has also been a governor of several schools in the city. He's, he's also a member, has been a member of FLAME for 27 years, traveling to Lourdes with children and young people with disabilities and has worked with the trust to raise funds to train young people to work disabled folk at Lourdes. He's been chair of Project Jennifer. That's something I only discovered while preparing this since 2002 when it was first established. And this is a project supporting the redevelopment of Scotland Road and Great Homer Street districts. So Bishop Tom speaks about something he's lived through, not all 175 years of it, <laughs> but uh, he's lived through much of it. He was there at the scene of action and has observed the struggle and the progress of bringing unity to divided communities in the city. In fact, this book tells that story very well, sectarian violence, the Liverpool experience. And he also worked with Professor Frank Neal in preparing this excellent book, which um, Bishop Tom has kindly given us copies for the library on Britain and the, the Irish famine. So he's lived through this and he reflects on this. He has a perspective on the issue that very few have. And we are delighted, ladies and gentlemen, this evening that he's willing to share these insights with us. And so, to Bishop Tom, our speaker, Christian faith in the city of Liverpool over 175 years, is it better together or getting worse? Bishop Tom. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it's lovely to see so many friends here tonight. I hope you all end up as friends. Um, when I was given this project, um, I must admit that for the first two months, um, I worried myself sick about it. And I thought to myself, who on earth starts a lecture with a question? Um, but anyway, uh, so please bear with me during this. Um, I'm proud of this, I'm pleased with it, but at the same time, I was sweating blood over it for a while. Let's begin with the question. Better together. So Google tells me it's an adjective phrase. It goes on to say, some verb has to be made to be understood to make a complete a prediction out of an adjective phrase like better together. We can talk about something being better, becoming better, remaining better, working out better, or functioning better together. In this city of Liverpool, better together was used as a byline by Tony McGann of the Aldonians. As you know, the Aldonian Community-Based Housing Association Limited was set up as a housing cooperative in 1983 by tenants from Eldon Street and Burlington Street of Vauxhall Road. Not only were they the remaining tenants of housing, council housing that was due for demolition, but more importantly, they were the descendants of a Catholic community, mostly of Irish descent, who had lived there for upwards of 150 years. Through famine, disease, prejudice, discrimination, unemployment, and political and religious turmoil. And yes, and the Blitz. 
They'd come through all that as a community. It gave them a special bond and a special pride. Now they and their immediate ancestors had been at the epicenter of the trials and tribulations of the poor in Liverpool since the beginning of the 19th century. I firmly believe that their story is a parallel story of the 175 years of the history of this university. From, for that community, their church, their parish centre, their schools, doctor's surgeries, clinics, jobs, local corner shops, their bakeries, their pubs, were being taken away from them and they were going to fight against it. They were determined to stand their ground, keep their integrity as a living and vibrant community, build for the future and stay together. Because being together, they reckoned they were better together. Bishop David Shepherd and Archbishop Derek Warlock stole, or shall we say, borrowed the same phrase when they wrote their book, which not only told their own personal stories, but cemented their commitment not only to the Aldonians, but to their own pastoral ministry to both the Anglican Diocese and the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Liverpool. By that very act, they, only, they also took ownership, not just of a good sound bite, but they committed themselves into a sacred covenant to do everything in their power to be actively better in the spirit of ecumenism and fraternal friendship. Working out to get better and functioning better. I want to begin with a story I'm reminded of a requiem mass some years ago for one of our priests at which Bishop Malone preached the sermon. The priest had been a classmate of Bishop Vincent and was famous for never being in one appointment for a long time as priest of a diocese or even in retirement. Bishop began the sermon brilliantly by saying, Father Jerry was more of a verb than a noun. On that note, I firmly believe that when we talk about ecumenism, we have to speak of it as a verb, not a noun. If it's a noun, it's empty and soulless and fixed. It becomes a catchword of what each individual wants to make of it. It makes faith private. We have to make our faith personal. Therefore, it has to be a verb. Being better, becoming better, working better, and functioning better. For the last 175 years, the two main Christian institutions of our diocese have established and controlled colleges and schools, and especially training colleges for teachers of those schools. When they amalgamated, they're all three, their hope was to be not just bigger, but all the richer in both heritage and effectiveness. Derek and David, together with other church leaders, reminded our city that unless we continue to work together and especially understand one another, to respect and yes, yes to love one another's history, and then unity would be a noun and not a verb. It would become unattainable. Uniformity is not, I beg your pardon, an unattainable uniformity and not a living, vibrant and active community of faith. A partnership of church unity. That is what hope aims to be. Our history together has not always been bad. The trouble is that we often only remember the bad. Our history is a collection of stories. And in the last 175 years, there are literally millions of them. The Eldonian story is but one of them. It's a story in which I played a very small part, in fact, very little, but I knew most of the players. 
And their motivation was sat founded on anger, but also on hope. Hence the name of this university. Again, another inspired move by Derek and David. The word hope was not some vague wishful thinking, but was going to be something real and active. To give it a spiritual concept, the players realized that it could only be achieved with much wisdom, understanding and right judgment, and also courage and forgiveness, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and yes, a large dollop of funding, because government funding must also have been a big factor. In the late 60s, I was training for the priesthood in the English College in Lisbon. My only lifeline at home was the weekly letter from my dad and a copy of the Football Echo and the Catholic Pictorial. No telephone or telly. The letter was always franked by the GPO with the phrase, Liverpool, city of change and challenge. How true that was. The post-war housing programme, the building of the new tunnel, the creation of Kirby Newtown, Speak, and later on, Skem and Runcorn, meant that the communities that I was born among was rapidly changing. They were being decamped. Those words, change and challenge, have become synonymous with demolition, closure, and destruction. In the North End alone, 250 pubs closed. 15 churches, all the hospitals, the Northern, Stanley, Bootle, Sutton, schools and clinics, parish centres and factories, and especially the Merchant Marine, and yes, the docks. At one time, 50,000 went to sea, 90,000 worked on the docks mostly part-time labour. That story and its historical context is well documented in many books and articles and in films and photographs of the past. As an historian once said to me, I walk through the streets of Liverpool and all I can see are ghosts of the past. Yes, Liverpool, the city of change and challenge is also the city of import and export. And I would like to parallel the 175 years of this university as an educational institution with not only world events that have happened during that period, but also with some of the individuals whose example and courage have been part of that journey. I was at a gathering of churches together in Lancashire a few years ago in the Anglican Diocese of Blackburn and the Catholic Diocese of Salford. It took place at Wally Abbey, a foundation that goes back to the Reformation times. There's a large wall there that divides the Anglican Church from the Catholic Church. The wall is high, it's immovable. We were all asked to stand and meet by the wall and the local Anglican minister invited everyone to place their hands on the wall and imagine that they were pushing the wall down. Let us push down what divides us, was his cry. And then someone piped up. It was me, actually. <laughs> but let's not forget why it was there in the first place. At the entrance of this building, there's a display of the university's history. As you come in tonight, who found your way, from small beginnings to the present. Now I'd just like to put some flesh on those displays, and certainly from a personal perspective. Personal because my own family history is both Catholic and Anglican and coincides with the same period of time and the same part of Liverpool. It's not always been the happiest of journeys mainly because Liverpool has been in the eye of the storm of nearly all world events. In 1844, for example, the population of this city was estimated at 286,000. In fact, and 656, that was the census. Coincidentally, in that same, the next year, 
1845, John Henry Newman, now saint, was received into the Catholic Church. This was to have a strong impact on education, even up to today. Also, it was part, the start in 1845, of the worst famine in European history, known as the Irish Famine. As you know, Liverpool's position is on the eastern bank of the River Mersey in the northwest of England, facing Ireland and beyond to the Americas. Our geographical position was to have immense social and economic consequences for Liverpool during the 18th and 19th centuries because of the rise of the North and South America as trading areas and the ease with which the Irish could come over at a phenomenal impact on our city. The ship owners and merchants of the port revealed an unparalleled ability to grasp every opening that presented itself. As we know, by 1844 and immediately after, Liverpool was undoubtedly the first port of the British Empire. We were at the forefront of technical developments from building ships, sailing ships, equipping ships and manning ships. Also, steam power brought a regularity of channel crossings that sail could not. These new steam packets were fast and because of competition on the Irish routes, cheap. By 1822, the Irish could cross over to Liverpool with comparative ease. From 1801 to 1844, the population had risen from 77,653 to 286,000, quadrupled almost. This rapid growth in the city's trade and shipping drew people from all classes and from all over Britain and the world. The inflow of entrepreneurial talent was a major in factor of the town's economy. It was also greatly affected by other world events. For the Catholic population in particular, there was not only the Irish immigration and the search for work and survival, but also the impact, believe it or not, of the French Revolution, 1789 to 1799, which had brought many priests and nuns to the shores of England and especially to Liverpool. In France, the reign of terror of 1793 in that country had targeted the enemies of liberty and the enemies of the people, which was to put many nuns and priests on trial. There was even a movement referred to as de-Christianization, which arrived to excise religion from French society and had dramatic effects. They turned churches into barns. In October 1793, public worship was forbidden. And over the next few months, all visible signs of Christianity were removed. Examples of this included the revolutionary calendar, which started with the advent of the French Republic as year one, and the names of its months reflected the seasons. They even introduced the 10-day week, which eliminated Sunday as a day of worship. A small group of English Benedictines and a certain Father Jean-Antoine Baptiste Gerardo arrived in Liverpool. A small house was purchased at the top of Mount Vernon and they started there a small school. Father Gerardo became their French teacher and from there wrote a series of French grammar books. The Benedictine story continued when they amalgamated with other communities and they left Liverpool to form Ampleforth. Father Gerardo was left stranded and eventually bought a property in Dryden Street off Scotland Road, which he called St. Anthony's Place and became known as the French Chapel. This small church was opened on Christmas Eve, 1804, with a wonderful display of lights all round the outside of the church. It was to become a beacon of hope for the immigrant population of fellow exiles from countries around Europe. Catholic 
and non-Catholic alike. He was also to become effectively the French consul in Liverpool, catering for the French prisoners in Kirktail Jail. Remember, we were at war with France. Many of those prisoners were used as stonemasons in, in the building of St. George's Hall and many of the stone buildings in the city. Business was booming in the town, the canals, the pottery industry, the cotton industry, all of which attracted an ever-growing population. The shameful part of our history of, of Liverpool is that it was a slaving port. Its ships and merchants dominated the transatlantic slave trade in the second half of the 18th century. Overall, Liverpool ships had transported half of the three million Africans carried across the Atlantic. Although few landed in the port, the town and its inhabitants derived great civic and personal wealth, which laid the foundations for the future. With 120 to 130 ships annually crossing the Atlantic in the two decades preceding the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. Although Liverpool merchants engaged in many trades and commodities, it's worthwhile remembering the ships were manned by Liverpool sailors, most of whom would have been Irish and therefore Catholic. I know this because in doing my own family history, I realized that great-grandfathers and fathers before them who were merchant seamen, both had had memories and stories to tell, which included slaves. On that point, have you ever wondered why so many Catholic families in Liverpool had a devotion to St. Martin de Porres, or Blessed Martin as I knew him, the black Dominican brother from Lima, Peru. He spent his time caring for African slaves when the ships landed in the port of Lima. His statue, or his memorial, paid for by families descended from those same sailors, is now in a prominent position in our cathedral. No slave ship was ever manned by its owners. It would be wrong to attribute all of Liverpool's success to the slave trade, but it was undoubtedly the backbone and the springboard of the town's prosperity. Churches and schools. I have a map, it's here on my left, of the town of Liverpool in 1837. Please have a look at this if you get a chance. It's fascinating. On the right-hand side of the map is a note detailing what the mapmakers describe as church and dissenting chapels within the town boundaries. They, there listed are 30 churches of England and five schools belonging to the Church of England. Eight Baptist chapels, one chapel for friends, five chapel, chapels for churches independent, one New Jerusalem, 12 Methodist churches, one Sandemanian, two Unitarians, and as an act, added extra, they put five Catholic chapels on the list. St. Anthony's, St. Mary's, St. Nicholas, St. Patrick's, and St. Peter's. Two kirks, two chapels, one synagogue, and one Roman Ionic Hebrew church. I've never heard of them before. We can assume that this was the situation within Liverpool when the Anglican Church founded their first teacher training college. And the Catholic Church, mainly under the reign later on of Bishop Brown and Bishop Goss, they invited the religious orders to come to teach. Jesuits, Salesians, Christian Brothers, De La Salle, Salvatorians, Notre Dame, FCJs, Sisters of Mercy, many more. In the first part of the 19th century, the situation was continually changing and evolving, especially for the Catholic population. I would like now just to read part of an address given by Professor Frank Neal on the occasion of the Great Hunger Commemoration Service held at St. Anthony's in Scotland Road on the 3rd of October, 1997. 
I've left a book for each one of you which commemorates that event. When we publish this booklet, and hopefully all you, you can all have a copy, it lists the words of the service, plus two lists de detailing the men, women, and children who were buried in both St. Anthony's and St. Martin's Anglican Church at the bottom of Sylvester Street, known now as the Simi. At St. Anthony's, there were 2,303 names of people buried in that one year. How many of those buried at St. Anthony's during 1847 who died as a result of typhus, and di diarrhea, measles is not known. In Liverpool as a whole, during 1847, nearly 60,000 people contracted typhus while approximately 40,000 suffered from other diseases. In the parish of Liverpool, 5,239 died of typhus, 2,236 of diarrhea, and the worst hit wards were Vauxhall, Scotland, and Exchange. This is part of Professor Frank Neal's address. I hope you bear with me as I read it. I was going to ask some actors to read it for tonight, but they cried off this morning, but never mind. This is what Father, uh, Professor Frank wrote. On the 1st of May, 1847, eight-year-old Luke Brothers died, his corpse lying on straw placed on a mud floor in a cellar in Bannister Street, Vauxhall. Surrounding the body were five other people suffering from typhus. At the inquest held on the 8th of May, the surgeon told the coroner's court that there wasn't one scrap of food in the child's stomach and that the cellar was unfit for human habitation. The brothers' family were Irish famine refugees. Only today do we have a reasonable picture of the effects of the Irish famine in Liverpool. The potato blight appeared in Ireland in August 1845 and partially destroyed crops ripening for picking. It reappeared in 1846, 1848 and 1849. In the ensuing famine, over one million died of starvation and famine-related diseases. In the headlong fight to escape the nightmare being lived out in Ireland, tens of thousands of the most destitute Irish fled to Britain in the hope of obtaining food and the chance of a better life. Of all British towns, Liverpool bore the brunt of the refugee invasion. The destruction of the potato crops of autumn 1846 was disastrous. It followed by a cold winter and the trimming down of the British government's relief policies in Ireland at the beginning of 1847 precipitated the largest exodus of the famine tragedy. During Black 47, over 116,000 Irish famine refugees came ashore at Clarence Steamship Dock in North Liverpool, mostly from the Gaelic-speaking areas of the West, Roscommon, Mayo, Galway, Sligo. They were rural people, disorientated and confused, most never having even experienced sea journeys and life in large towns. We have strong evidence that many embarking at Dublin had walked from the west of Ireland. Travelling on the decks of small cargo steamers, they arrived in a poor physical condition. The effects of malnutrition exacerbated by exposure and wind, rain and sea. Equally, many were carrying their bodies, in their bodies, the seeds of typhus. The poor law authorities of the parish of Liverpool were totally unprepared for the mass of poverty which threatened to engulf the town in early 1847. After leaving Clarenstock, the refugees flooded into the stinking cellars of the already overcrowded poverty. Stricken Irish wards of Scotland, Vox Vauxhall, Exchange and St Paul's. At this time, an estimated 30,000 people were occupying cellars 
most of which were devoid of furniture, water or sanitation. On the 1st of January 1847, the Liverpool Mercury informed its readers, the number of starving Irish men, women and children daily landed on our keys is appalling and the parish of Liverpool has at present the painful and most costly task to encounter of keeping them alive, if possible. The worst scenes of absolute destitution occurred in the north end of Liverpool, in the densely populated triangle between Great Cross Old Street, Vauxhall Road and Scotland Road, an area containing more Irish than most Irish towns of that period. Through the relief efforts of the poor law guardians averted large-scale deaths from starvation. They couldn't prevent scenes of extreme suffering which horrified observers and brought home to the British public for the first time the reality of events in Ireland. <clears throat> I've also included in that little book um, the ages and religions of all the paupers buried by the Liverpool Poor Law Guardians and the select vestry. Those without means of support became paupers and entered the workhouse on Brownlow Hill. At Brownlow Hill, the present site of our Catholic cathedral and from where the poor authorities had to provide graves for all those who died destitute. Those pauper graves were originally at St. Mary's Graveyard, Cambridge Street, behind Myrtle Street Children's Hospital and up at Abercrombie Square. And when this filled up, they were buried in St. Martin's of the Fields Graveyard, as I said, known as the Simi. Of the total of 7,219 pauper burials in the year 1847, 73% were Catholic. Taken with St. Anthony's, at least 43% of all burials during, in Liverpool during that year were also Catholic. On October 1847, Father Thomas Seed, a young priest in St. Anthony's Church, told the president of the English College at Lisbon in his letter to him, his alma mater, quote, little did I expect to find on arriving at Liverpool that this, that this priest-killing town would be the scene of my labours. We visit the sick from 10 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. If anyone wants to have an idea of real misery, he has only to enter the dark, filthy cellars of the poor, dying Irish. If you wish to read more of that terrible period of history, read Frank Neal's book, Black 47. It's full of the most horrendous facts. You will also then realise why our city was known as the Graveyard of Ireland. The booklet of St. Anthony's Memorial Service also contains the picture of a memorial plaque containing the portrait of the ten Catholic clergy who died of fever during that same year. They halved the priesthood. But it's also good to realise that in the same year, 38 nurses died and 37 port authority workers also died because, unbeknown to them, the cause of most of the deaths was transmitted by fleas. The dead also numbered many of a priest's housekeeper taking the coat. But on that memorial plaque, it's interesting to note that education is also mentioned. It reads, this is what it says on the plaque. Like true champions of the cross and valiant heroes of Christianity, they boldly went forth in the service of the great king whom they had vowed allegiance, where the shafts of death fell thick around them. By their deeds they proved themselves disciples of the Lord, who had said, By this shall men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. They had love, the greatest love. Greater love than this no man hath, that a man lay down his life for his friends. They were good and faithful shepherds. The good shepherd giveth life for his sheep. 
They now rest from their labors. May their memory be in benediction and long preserved among all who've witnessed or heard of their devotedness. Spiritual consolation and temporal aid of the afflicted poor was the business of their lives, truly acting like good Samaritans by pouring oil, the oil of comfort onto the wounds of their woe-stricken fellow creatures. May their example be an incentive to others in similar circumstances and go and do likewise. And then it adds, to further the cause of education among the poor boys and girls in their congregations was an object dear to them while living. And the present effort is made in the hope of assisting such benevolent intentions on those little ones who in life they gathered under their protection to impart to them the flame of charity which warmed their own hearts. May heaven's blessing be upon their undertaking. I have boxes here, well, actually, they're on the table, listing all those who were buried in St. Anthony's from 1833 to 1858. You can see how thick the sheaves are. There's 500 pages there. And they make fascinating reading. Computers give a three-dimensional view of statistics. And I discovered that in that same year, 1847, of all babies baptized at St. Anthony's, usually the morning after birth, 47% of them died before they were six months old. And 87% of them died before they were 10 years of age. If you ever wonder, and if you ever wonder why anyone has a surname called St. Anthony or St. John, you may be interested to know that they were normally given to children who were abandoned at the back of the church. When we were researching the history of St. Anthony's church and school, one day I received a message from Brother Ken Vance from St. Francis Saviour's that he had a copy of a document regarding an almighty row between the Jesuits who'd moved to Salisbury Street and the parish priest of St. Anthony's. The letter was in Latin, it'd been sent to Rome, and it wasn't signed. <laughs> Brother Ken reckoned that it must have come from Bishop Brown, the first Catholic bishop. I asked Monsignor Alston, a Latin scholar, to translate it for me. Of course, the letter was about money and territory and schools. The parish priest, Father Newsham, was furious with the Jesuits that they were stealing all of his rich parishioners and that all of these Lancashire Catholics were sending their boys to them for education. He was being left, as he said, with the poor and destitute, which was the reason why he couldn't pay his debts and the parish was declared bankrupt. In fact, St. Anthony's Church was never consecrated because you couldn't consecrate a church unless you'd paid for it. At the end of the said letter, the author, in exasperation, says that he has tried everything to make peace. But whatever he says to either side, he ended up by realising that he was singing to the deaf. They were deaf to one another. They were not listening. And maybe that's what's happened very often among us as churches, even within our own. It's obvious then that education was a means of conflict as well as of healing. Bishop Goss adopted a policy of not building any cathedral for the Catholic population of the city. He stopped Pugin's design being completed in St. Domingo Road, having only the Lady Chapel completed, became Our Lady Immaculate's parish. And he decided to build schools within the community. Once the schools were built, they went on to build new churches. This policy was so successful that from 1847 to 1990, 
every parish in the north and south ends of the city had a large school and a large church, most of, most of whom were catered for by religious orders who brought with them their own teaching methods and structure. From those dark days to the present, there have been many heroes and heroines of all denominations and none who dedicated their heroic lives in and around these same communities to teach and to inspire. The Liverpool experience of sectarian virus, violence was superbly illustrated in the book of the same name written by Professor Frank Neal. I've left a copy here and some copies have left the university. The central concern of his book is the origin, scale, and nature of sectarian violence in 19th century Liverpool. The period covered could be described as Victorian, but the tensions existed in working class Liverpool, which in reality was the whole of the North and South Ends, arising from sectarian bitterness, survive, surviving until comparatively recently. Anyone born and raised in working class Liverpool in pre-slum pre clearance days could not fail to be aware of religious differences, which of course included educational differences in that society. And in those incidences, they had disastrous consequences very often for friendships and for families. My own family was part of that same story. My mother's father, William Henry Rankin, born in Skirving Street, an area filled with courts bearing the image of King William of Orange in full regalia. At the age of 29, he volunteered to join the Liverpool Powells in the First World War, having only three years before married Sarah Ann Conlon, my grandmother, who was from Taliesin Street. Her family was originally from Mayo. She is Irish Catholic, whose father and grandfather had been merchant seamen for some 30 years. They had both been scorned and abandoned in many ways by their respective tribes. And when the depression and poverty met them in full, full flow in the 1930s, they were often left to their own devices. Even when the only consolation was the local St. Vincent de Paul Society, when my grandmother and five of her children died aged between six months and 16 years, within three months due to the effects of drinking bad milk and contracting tuberculosis. William Henry Rankin, my granddad, died before the end of the Second World War, a man broken by a post-World War that was far worse than the one he'd left. He was buried in a pauper's grave at Anfield, which is now in one of the footpaths in the cemetery. The local parish priest wouldn't bury him because he wasn't a Catholic. But this story, though personal, is some way only typical of many stories of that period. To conclude, I would like to go back to the beginning, which was a question, a reciprocal question. The Christian faith in the city of Liverpool over 175 years, is it better together or getting worse? I must admit I've, that I've agonized over the silliness of starting a paper with a question which would seem to be impossible to answer. But I must admit I was encouraged when I read last Sunday's gospel of St. Luke in which Jesus himself finished his teachings with his disciples also with a question. His question was, when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on earth? It was a gospel message of hope that God would see justice done to his chosen who cry to him. The story of Liverpool and the story of the history of this college are filled with people of faith who have given their lives to education and to this community, to our city. They, in their own way, cried to God 
to lift people up, to enlighten, to support, to inspire. Archbishop Warlock and Bishop David shared the same vision. And it must be said also, the Methodists, all the denominations of the city, that this vision would be realized, it would be fulfilled only by St. Catherine's and Christ College and the other college coming together with the same desire. In the first reading, also from last Sunday, it was from the book of Exodus. There's an inspiring, almost comical image in that reading of Moses sitting on a stone with his arms raised in the air as his nation battled against the enemy. It was an image that reminded me of a football manager when he raises his arms in the air when a side are winning and drops them when they struggle. Everton have their arms down all the time at the moment. But the hope of this college, which is founded on sound teaching and faith, has to be that of a cornerstone similar to the one that Moses sat on. The future years are full of challenges and battles, battles for our society, socially, spiritually, and yes, emotionally. We are changing as a community. And in many ways, we're getting worse because people are taking extreme views. Yes, we're often more decisive and at worst, indifferent and cynical. But the history of this city and this community is about winning the struggles. We have to come through the trauma of our own history with hope, dignity, and like the Eldonian, Eldonians and many others, we do that by having a determination and a will to be better together. At the canonization, canonization of John Henry Newman this month, a passage of St. Paul to Timothy was used. Newman, an Oxford scholar, an Anglican priest, a Catholic priest of the oratory, a cardinal and a saint, this passage of scripture was his inspiration. From Timothy. Be urgent in season and out of season. Convince and rebuke. Be unfailing in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears to suit their own liking. Will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, be ready. Endure suffering. Fulfill your mission. One further story. I was at a funeral two weeks ago of a friend, a member of my class from Manfield Street uh, Primary School. We'd been together 60 years ago. There were eight of us from our communion class. But we all agreed that our best teacher was Miss McCartney from year six. We'd always thought she was Paul McCartney's auntie, but I don't know whether she was. <laughs> Yet no one could remember anything that she said. All we remembered was that she was responsible for inspiring each one of us in a very special way. She had the ability of bringing out the best. She gave each of us hope in our own ability, and we each realized that we were better people and achieve better things because of her. I've often described myself as a survivor, and I have the blood to prove it and the emotional scars, but I also have a great pride and respect for family and belonging, for my teachers and those who inspired them. Our city is a port and has imported and exported talented and gifted people, as well as goods from all over the world. I believe that we have the edge that others do not have, an edge which has been honed by our history and our heritage, often unheralded, unheralded people like Miss McCartney. This university, Hope University, will be judged by the fruit it produces. 
that is, its leaders, its teachers, its inspirers. May it never be just an end in itself with qualifications, but be a springboard for the future filled with hope. I've always believed that we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And my prayer is that we never kick them in the teeth, but we always be shoulders for others to stand on. And I'd simply like to finish with a prayer. Um, it's not my prayer. It's taken from one of the Eucharistic prayers of the church. Uh, Jesus went about doing good. I think it really sums up all I've been trying to say and all that this university stands for. Grant that all the faithful of the church, looking into the signs of the times by the light of faith, may constantly devote themselves to the service of the gospel. Keep us attentive to the needs of all, that sharing their grief and pain, their joy and hope, we may faithfully bring them the good news of salvation and go forward with them along the way to our kingdom. Thank you. I can't hear you very much. Sorry, sir. What did you make of uh, the fact of um, uh, the narrative of the blitz that, that actually you know, uh, broke open many of the ghettos? So that you know, uh, people suddenly found that they could be on the outskirts of the rule and their neighbours would be either Protestant or Catholic, and actually they were sort of human and they knew them. And it made quite a significant. In some ways, I mean, I, I suppose it's personal stories. Um, I think the First World War had more effect um, with soldiers uh, fighting together, coming from the same community, um, and the Second World War as well. I think that broke down a lot of the uncertainties. Um, I think the Blitz, in some ways, my mother often told the story of um, the day after the May Blitz, she was working in the BA making cigarettes and uh, she lived on a, on a table. And there were three sisters who worked opposite to her who had died the night before in Burlington Street. And uh, I think, I've forgotten the number, I think it was 300 people died in one night. But they were all very much from that community, from Holy Cross Parish. Uh, in some ways, I, I, I think many occasions, I know one lady told me once from Our Lady Max that um, they, at the beginning of the, the Blitz, when the alarms went, they used to go down to the crypt under St. Anthony's with all the graves, 680 graves there. And she said, my gran said, I'd rather face Hitler face to face than be in there again. <laughs> so there was different experiences. The other thing was that the schools, the children, very often went to, uh, certainly away from the city. The excavation. I think... Uh, seeing a different world, you know, where there was cows and goats and ducks. Uh, for the young children, that was an opening to a bigger world. Uh, but I think the other thing was that it's a port, and most of the men who went to sea had experience of working away many times with different people, different breeds. Uh, the... The, the more denominational elements, I mean, I know in the Royal Liverpool, when I first went there, it was known as a Welsh Methodist hospital, even in, and all the, nearly all the consultants were Welsh. Most of the senior staff were Welsh. In the education department, um, most of the, certainly when I started in Our Lady Immaculates in 1984, uh, most of the primary uh, advisors even had meetings in Welsh. 
Um, you know, so, and, and I think sometimes when you look at it, there were little ghettos, but generally speaking, I think it's much wider than just the Blitz. The Blitz, there was only two bombings, as, as you remember, even though there was many call-outs. I think the journey lasted a lot longer, and I think it's clear that uh, people, caring people, were involved all the way through. Sorry. I think a lot of it depends on the people. I mean, it's not polite, but I know Faith Academy is often known as no Faith Academy um, by some cynical people. The point is, it's when you talk about faith and uh, uh, baptism. In St. Anthony's, uh, when I was there, uh, I had a policy of never ever refusing baptism, of the tradition of infant baptism. That's frowned on even by many priests nowadays where people have to prove their faithfulness before they get baptized, or their children are. Um, I've always resisted that. Uh, and in some ways, you meet people where they are. Uh, some people, it's about identity and belonging. And I think it's important that you have a sense of belonging, um, that you have a sense of identity. It's important, I think, that th this is, and people have it. If I go to schools and visit schools, there's only one question the children want to know. It's who do you support? <laughs> and that's the only way they'll ever re reach any real passion. You know, they're passionate. Well, that used to be the same with faith. In fact, it was harder to get children to go to school than it was to get them to go to church. Uh, so it, it, this, I think we need to get back to the sense of belonging, the sense of identity. And that doesn't mean to say you, it's about fighting, it's about rivalry. It really is about uh, being proud of who you are and what that means. And I think that's one thing I wanted to emphasize tonight. It's not about, um, when I was hospital chaplain uh, or when we were national chaplains, sometimes were people saying, well, what do we need this for? That you know, one covers everything. Uh, we, we have an ecumenical chaplaincy that didn't mean anything in some ways because people wanted to be, receive the sacraments or they, there was an opportunity sometimes for working together. Rob Lewis, who's here tonight, I used to pass on names to him and he'd pass on names to me because people would be upset if they thought that what they believed in didn't ma ma matter anymore. So their sense of pride and sense of belonging was important. I remember um, one story when there was a young man who was dying, um, sadly he had cancer. He must have been in his mid-thirties. And the staff said to me, um, uh, we think he's a Catholic because he's got all these things around his bed like rosary beads and holy pictures and bottles and statues. And she said, um, uh, and his wife is pregnant. She said, it's a very sad occasion. So I said, well, next time she comes in, um, would you mind giving me a shout and I'll have, have a word. So I'd, I'd, I'd spoken to him. And um, anyway, when she came, I, we went into the side, side ward just to chat to her. And the nurse said, I'm going to make you a cup of tea. And uh, I'm sitting there with her. And I said, she said, well, I'm not a Catholic, she says. I said, well, who brought in all the holy pictures and medals and things. Was that his mother? Oh no, she said, I brought them in. If anything works, she said, I'll try anything. <laughs> she said, I've even brought him in a bottle of Our Lady's water. <laughs> so I said to her, a first class relic. <laughs> but of course, we started laughing and she was laughing on my shoulder, tears coming down her eyes, relief. And I'm laughing as well. Goodness knows what the nurse made when she came in with a cup of tea. But it's those situations, I think, sometimes where you've got to be where people are and uh, don't tell them that what they believe in isn't important. 
Sorry. So. Can I just put in a word for the Prime Minister? This is my parish, St. Francis Davis, and uh, then the corporate St. Peter's. Two years ago, we were in special needs. Now, We were given good with some outstanding by the recent inspectors and from the two dioceses of Liverpool, Anglican and Catholic, we were on the section 48 religious exam. They said if there were a grade above outstanding, we would give it to you. And of course the Echo voted Faith Prime School school in the city for this year. So we're dead short. on dialogue. I think um, our, our new Cardinal, Michael Fitzgerald, talked about the need for dialogue, talking to one another. I mean, I, I went into the, um, the garage in uh, Islington recently, a BP garage, and uh, I, I don't know where they're from, but the, the young man behind the counter, when I walked in with my collar on, he started um, singing in Arabic, uh, chanting his uh, Muslim things. He saw me as a threat. I, I was going to pay him. I wasn't going to walk away. <laughs> but it's, it was strange to me that he was wearing, uh, he'd just come, for, I suppose, from prayers. Uh, but also, and there was a little shop at the end of Hope Street, a little sweet shop. And when we had the relics of uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux a few years ago, I did the opening service. I mean, there were 5,000 people uh, at that service all around the cathedral. And um, it's very impressive. The next day, I went into the shop to get the paper. And uh, the young lad behind the counter, who's from Morocco, said to me, that was great that yesterday, Father. Brilliant. I said, were you there? Never miss an opportunity to pray, he said. Never miss an opportunity to pray. And in some ways, just the, the way of people express you can get both reactions. I, I think the essence is, it's an unknown, but I think we've got to keep open the channels of dialogue, uh, be who we are, but keep dialogue. It's gonna change. The city is changing socially, economically, in every sense. It's a new world, and it's moving very fast. Um, some people are feeling very, the last thing we should do is put the barricades up, but at the same time, I think we've got to be open and honest and uh, uh, respectful uh, to one another. No more? Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've left, uh, there's some c copies of, of the, those small books in the room where you were before if you went. Please take one. Um, uh, there should be enough for everybody there. And uh, the other books I made reference to Professor Frank Neal, uh, who's sadly dead now, but we, he published these books through Manchester University Press when he was working there as a professor, but he was also involved in Liverpool. And um, we became great friends, but he did say, do you realize how important uh, the inner city, the city of Liverpool is in not just Irish, but the way we dealt with things? We are an example <coughs> to the whole world, the whole world of the way we dealt with situations. Badly at first, and then we got our act together. And I think in some ways, we tend to think of the city as sort of, well, you know, 
I, I remember even one of the bishops said to me, oh, you're Scouse, are you? You know, Scally. Uh, sometimes we have these labels on us. We should stand proud, stand proud all the time the way we've dealt with it. And I think in some ways, the history that we tell is the way people have dealt with the most difficult situations. I mean, the situations that I described before uh, of, of the sellers uh, would be the worst, seven times than the worst situation in the world today. Even in Yemen, seven times worse. Um, we've been through the mill. We've got the badges. We, 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 we can do that. And I don't think, so. sometimes I'm accused of being an inverted snob. I suppose I am, because I'm proud of this city, but I'm also proud of the way people have responded. Uh, that's the essence. It's not the traumas, it's the way you cope with them and the way you carry on after. Yeah, so it wasn't so much the, uh, the actual famine, it was the diseases that accompanied this and the lack of medicine. I mean, they always thought it was caused through miasma. They didn't realise it was caused through fleas and uh, there was no antibiotics. So uh, people, and there was no running water. In one street in the Holy Cross, Lace Street, um, in a street no bigger than this room, um, 437 people died in one year because they had still water barrels in the middle of the street. I mean, terrible traumatic journeys, but um, you know, we have the names to prove it, but I think the memories should be treasured and not always used as a, something to whip ourselves with. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. <clears throat>